Why don't you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself and how long you've been here at CBS? I'm Bill Plant, a correspondent for CBS News. I cover the White House, have for most of the last 23 years, and I've been at CBS for 40 years. Okay, and so in the, in the film that I'm looking at, I'm looking at the buildup to the uh, military intervention in Iraq. So when you look back onto this time period, what type of thoughts um, come to your mind? I covered the White House during the run-up to this Iraq war. There was a great deal of coverage devoted to whether the United States would A, seek a second United Nations resolution, B, convince the other members of the Security Council to vote for that resolution, and C, convince the American public that war was necessary. All of those things were covered at some length. The debate became acrimonious at times. There were substantial portions of the opposition in Washington, both the Democrats in Congress and uh, policy people who thought that the war was ill-advised at least until the inspections process sanctioned by the UN had run its course. But it was clear from at least the beginning of 2003, if not sooner, that the Bush administration was determined to go to war and was basically going through the motions of trying to get the United Nations to agree. In the end, the United Nations agreed to inspections but not to war and the war began in any case. And so when you're looking at this, um, this time period, at what point did you realize that, they, that that war was inevitable, that they were determined to go to war? It seemed to me that war was almost inevitable as far back as the fall of 2002. It seemed all but inevitable at the beginning of 2003. And so in, in the case of uh, this time period, you had the congressional resolution passed in early October. And so um, talk a little bit about Congress, the, the, the Congress's role um, during this time period um, and, and whether or not, you know, we'll talk about after the time period, but let's talk about, you know, during the buildup to, uh, you know, starting from like August to October, the Congress's role in this. When you look at Congress's role in the run-up to the war, you have to see it in the context of the reaction to what happened to the United States on 9-11. Many members of Congress had serious misgivings about another war in the Middle East, in Iraq. But at the same time, when it was suggested that there was some connection, and the connection was only uh, vaguely suggested, it was never, almost never, directly uh, hinted at or directly made. It was hinted at, but not directly made. But just the fact that the United States had been attacked was enough to put most members of Congress on edge because they knew, deeply felt, that their constituents wanted answers, wanted the feeling of security and safety, wanted to assure that this sort of thing could never happen again. Uh, they knew that the national psyche had been damaged. Members of Congress, particularly members of the House, are extraordinarily sensitive to public opinion because they run every two years. Therefore, even many of those who had personal concerns or reservations about the war uh, were listening to their constituents and very concerned about how they would feel and didn't feel that the constituent concern that they heard outweighed uh, what they considered the inadequacy of the argument. That was the situation in Congress. And so when you, when you look at that, do you see that the uh, elections in November played a part in the, the vote that happened in, in early October? Um, you, you mentioned something about constituents and they had to make a wait. Um, so was that a factor as well? It probably was. There's been a considerable amount of analysis uh, on, on the effect of 9-11 on the election of uh, 2002. Um, I'm not really in a position to, to reanalyze it for you, but it was obviously on everybody's mind in that campaign. And uh, what brought it back to the fore in the debate about the war in Congress was uh, the widespread belief promoted by the government that we were subject to attack again. 
And, and so when you look at after October, if you have a general consensus in Congress, and then after that point, can the media fill the void of, of the normal he said, she said, you know, constraints of objectivity? First of all, you didn't have a complete consensus in Congress, even though there was a vote to authorize the use of force. You still had dissenting voices well into February and even March. Uh, reviewing some scripts from that period, I noticed uh, that uh, in mid-March, we still had the, uh, the Democrat leader of the Senate, Senator Daschle, uh, complaining about the rush to war without the completion of arms inspections, and he was certainly not the only voice. So Congress wasn't silent. That's the first thing. Uh, nor were media, uh, Congress wasn't silent, nor were critics of the idea of war who were also heard in the media, perhaps not to the degree that the government's message was heard, but they were heard nonetheless. It, I guess in this time period, what I kind of notice is in what Jay Rosen and both Tom Rosenstiel say is this real politique um, attitude towards the United Nations and politics of reality of the situation. That in a way, it was covered that uh, as a political issue as, as opposed to a legal issue. Can you talk about covering the UN, uh, these resolutions, as uh, political versus legal issues? If by legal issue you mean uh, the responsibility of the United States to the United Nations uh, and to the rest of the world, um, there are, as you know, widely differing uh, understandings of exactly what that is, starting with the administration, which it seems feels very little obligation. But uh, we do, it's true, look at these things as political stories. This was the story in the United Nations of the United States trying to get the support of France and Germany. The political angle on this was that France and Germany were unwilling to support the United States in a war against Iraq for several reasons, not the least of which was they had significant commercial concessions in Iraq, which they wished to assure in the wake of any war, significant debt which Iraq owed them, and significant reasons uh, of their own, real politic reasons, not to support the United States. France, for example, uh, wished to be seen as the leader of the European Union, the preeminent nation. Uh, and uh, Germany, it seems, was more concerned with the commercial aspects. Those were the political angles which we saw and covered. Those were the primary story in the UN, not uh, any, any argument really about uh, the UN, uh, the US's legal obligations to the UN or to the world community. And what I when I'm looking through the transcripts and rewatching a lot of the footage, what I kind of notice is analogous to political coverage. There's a lot of horse race. Who's up? Who's down? Who's with us? Who's against us? Uh, and I think we, you run into the same type of thing in election coverage, you know, the poll numbers, and as opposed to actually attacking uh, or addressing the issues of uh, what the actual substance of the arguments were. So when you look back at this time period, can you kind of like uh, address, you know, the event-based coverage versus issue-based coverage of the UN? The big issue um, was whether or not there were weapons of mass destruction. We now know that there appear not to have been, or that if there were, they somehow disappeared. The argument was whether the United Nations would send, it would have time to send in another team of inspectors to determine whether Iraq possessed uh, what WMD, either chemical, biological, or nuclear. This, uh, the argument focused on the weapons of mass destruction. Um, the argument was also heavily influenced by the notion that Iraq might somehow have been connected to, at, if not to 9-11, at least to the shadowy terrorist network which uh, promoted jihad and 9-11. Uh, it's, um, I've lost the thread of your question, actually. Well, it, well I guess what I'm asking is, um, it, 
you know, what what was the actual why did the United States in January, for example, why did they decide to go after a second resolution? Well, there's no doubt in my mind that the reason the United States went for a second United Nations resolution was that they hoped to get international sanction or the sanction of the Security Council for a campaign against Iraq that was seen as the interim step. First, the resolution which would authorize <coughs> another arms inspection. Then the second vote, which of course the United States never sought because it was clear that it would not carry. But it was seen, I think, as a stepping stone uh, toward an operation into Iraq. And when, when you look at um, some of the, the statements of the Bush administration, for example, on March 6, President Bush says, no matter what the whip count is, we're going to, you know, uh, take this to a vote, and then they don't end up doing that. Um, why didn't they end up, you know, taking, I mean, if, if he's on the public record saying that we're definitely going to take it to a vote, and then they don't take it to a vote, you know, is it? They didn't take it to a vote because they would have lost. And he's not the first politician to promise something and not do it. And, and so one thing that Tom Rosenstiel said is that um, this administration, in a way, uh, their communication strategy, they know how the media works better than the media itself knows how they work. Do you think that's true? Or? No, I don't necessarily. But if you give me some examples, I'll try to talk about it. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, uh, well, yeah. I'm not. I'm not going to be uh, including my my particular my uh, my question. But yeah, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, if you if you have uh, a lot of events that are going on over uh, periods of time, and you're covering those events, uh, such as um, the the second Security Council uh, authorization and the, the administration. Well, I guess a better example is uh, let's say back on December 18th. Um, you did a report where um, you said at the end, uh, this is right after the Iraqi declaration was submitted, and you said, well, if Saddam, Saddam is basically damned if he does and damned if he doesn't. And there seemed to be a pattern of behavior that the United States had a disdain towards the weapons inspectors, that they didn't, they, they were looking for procedural violations after that point and continuing after that point, but yet, if Bush has a press conference and says weapons of mass destruction, that'll still be the lead. So it's an event base as opposed to looking at the issue over, over periods of time. So I guess the question would be, did you see a pattern of behavior of the Bush administration that they did not uh, want to uh, have the inspections work or they were trying to discredit the weapons inspectors? What we saw was uh, the use of the weapons inspection as uh, a means to an end. The means to the end was either to find a violation or to get that over with so that the United States could proceed to build the coalition and invade Iraq, which it seemed intent on doing. The um, coverage uh, that I've reviewed shows that there was intense skepticism about whether the UN inspections really mattered and to the United States in its determination to go to war. It was widely viewed in a political framework as something that needed to be done to appease world opinion and perhaps to find something which would have been even better. And, and so I guess a follow-up is uh, when you look at everything that's come out now and you look back, you know, how would you answer the question, why did the United States go to war with Iraq? My belief is that the United States went to war with Iraq because this administration believed that it was important to show the world American power in the Middle East. They picked on Saddam Hussein because he was the area's most demonstrable bad guy and because uh, they believed, I, I think, that he did possess weapons of mass destruction. There's no evidence uh, that anybody has yet found that he was connected to 9-11, but that's beside the point. This was an exercise in American muscle flexing, um, and it was intended, as the President laid out in his speech in February of 2003, to 
show the way to remaking the Middle East, to bringing democracy not only to Iraq, but to show the way to uh, peace in between Israel and the Palestinians, for example. This was the reason, ultimately, I think, that the United States went to war in Iraq. And during the buildup to the war in Iraq, is it the media's role, or CBS, ABC, NBC, to do segments on why are we doing this, why are we going to war? It's the media's role to examine very carefully everything that the government says. Now, this government, this administration, like all administrations, uh, puts the best face on all its public communication. This is generally known as spin. They say the same things over and over. They repeat them. They get carried uncritically in the uh, sort of anodyne flow of news, which is what the wire services do, um, and what, what is repeated on many radio stations, on many news broadcasts. It is simply the government version of the story on any given day. It's our responsibility to bring some context to that, and we try. Um, all of us have tried at one time or another to uh, help bring context, to interpret, uh, to show in conjunction with other events and with past events what it seems that the government intends despite what it says. We are successful in varying degrees and we are successful or not in the eye of the beholder. And, and so when you, in your interview with uh, Martha Joint Kumar back in August or April of, of this year, you mentioned um, that you see the, the evening news networks as a wire service, as a headline service. Can you kind of elaborate on that? Because you now have 24-hour news available globally and from many different sources, the evening news broadcasts on the networks now put the day's news generally into the first news block and then try to do some interesting feature work. <coughs> Sorry, I should have brought some water in here. Um, <coughs> it probably wouldn't be a good idea. Okay, so just to start from the top of, you know, and <coughs> I'm be including my question. So right. when, you, when you look at the news as a headline in wire service, so the, the evening news. Because news is available everywhere globally, 24 hours, the evening news broadcasts on the networks generally compress the day's headlines into the first block. That doesn't mean that we do it without context. I think we offer more context uh, in our brief presentations of the daily headlines, particularly on government issues, than you will get on a lot of the cable broadcasts, which simply repeat what the government has said verbatim. We generally do try to provide some, again, context. Perhaps we don't succeed often enough, but we try. Okay. And when you, uh, um, I'm sorry, I lost my, my train of thought. When you, uh, oh, okay. Uh, one example, I guess, of, um, of the, the Bush administration, uh, what I, from what I see, is uh, around um, August, or uh, I'm sorry, March 7th, uh, when Hans Blix was about to make his presentation at the UN. Um, there was a press conference the night before, uh, and then the next day, the Bush administration announced a 10-day ultimatum that they, in a way, they knew it didn't matter what El Bayarde said about the evidence or anything, and that that would wipe out the, the actual substance of what El Bayarde was saying about the Niger claims, about the aluminum tubes, about the evidence. So when you look back on that, and you see this deadline that they, they created. You know, what, what are some of your thoughts on, on that particular that deadline? The deadline, which was announced uh, in March, early March of 2003, was simply further evidence to most of us that the administration was determined to go to war no matter what the weapons inspectors found. It was quite clear by then that they didn't quite trust Hans Blix to, uh, to do the job uh, or to find anything, and uh, it wasn't going to matter what the weapons inspectors reported. There was going to be a war. There wasn't any doubt in our minds at the time, and I think we communicated that 
uh, to the public. And so when you when you see the uh, did you see that the that there was a lot of uh, events? I mean, it, it, just talk a little bit about your constraints uh, when you when you're doing stories every day, um, and you you know how do you, how do you go about that? You know, and is there time for second day stories also? In other words, when when during this time period, during that time period, there was a story every day, and frequently you would have to reprise what happened the day before. So in that sense, there was more opportunity for second day pieces than there usually is. But the second day aspect was usually subsumed into the headline of the day. But very often, they were not very far apart. We were dealing with the same topic night after night, morning after morning. And one thing that you mentioned in um, the interview with Martha John Kumar is the elimination of a research department. Um, tell me a little bit about when you're, when you're gathering information for a story, is it you and the producer or do you have a research department here or do you use the internet or talk a little bit about that? When we gather information for a story, there are usually almost always certainly on the White House beat two people working on it, the producer and the reporter. Both of them reach out to uh, experts or politicians whom we may wish to interview and both of us do the research. It's true that we don't have a large research department here, which we once did, but it's also true that it is easier than ever to access all kinds of material with a few keystrokes. We have full-time access uh, via the internet to uh, Nexus, and we have the internet itself. Uh, the search functions, as everybody by now knows, are nothing short of astonishing. You can bring up just about anything uh, in a matter of seconds. And that is what we do. We do our own research. Uh, it gets double-checked. When the script goes to New York, it passes through two hands here before it goes to New York, and then is read not only by the producers in New York, but also by a researcher fact-checker in New York, uh, who does indeed check uh, and question. So there are several layers. And I guess one one blur that I that I see is the um, the regime change policy. Did you ever have time to dig back into the uh, Iraq <coughs> Liberation Act of 1998 and, and kind of see the genesis of the regime change policy? I don't think that we did take a close look at the regime change policy during the war. The current administration used it um, used the fact uh, that that act had been passed in 1998 to extend the notion of regime, regime change back to the previous administration, which uh, was fair enough as far as it went. Of course, the previous administration does not appear to have contemplated armed conflict in order to affect regime change. So there was a shift, in other words, that when it was passed, it didn't imply military armed conflict. And then did you see a shift or a, a reinterpretation of that policy? I think we didn't have to go back to the Regime Change Act to see that this administration was determined to have a regime change uh, by force of arms. That certainly was no mystery. To the extent that they used the Act of 1998 to justify it, um, it's, uh, it's certainly true that that isn't necessarily what lawmakers had in mind, but uh, they didn't justify it on that basis. They didn't claim that that gave them military authorization. So again, I think that was largely uh, something left in the past. I think the, the issue comes when Ari Fleischer says it's our official United States foreign policy. Who sets the foreign policy? Is it a sense of Congress language resolution passed in 98 or is it the United States or is it the president? Who, who can set foreign policy? The president makes foreign policy in this government, but it was the sense of Congress, as expressed in that act, that uh, regime change uh, was a desirable thing in Iraq. And when Fleischer cited that, he was doing it to buttress the administration's position. And when we journalists who cover the place every day look at that, we say, okay, he's reaching into the bag for an argument to support what they intend to do in any case. And 
generally shrug it off. And, and so when you draw these types of conclusions, when you listen, in, in your objectivity constraints, uh, how can you get these points of view out? Do you search for quotes or uh, it's, it's sort of in a way adjudicating the facts? Um, you know, can you, how do you draw conclusions and how do you separate drawing conclusions versus presenting what both sides say? You point out what one side says, then you point out what a fact may be, what others have to say about this, and you demonstrate for the benefit of the audience, we hope, that uh, there is more than one way to see this issue. It's true that the viewpoint of the administration probably receives most of the coverage, but not all. And there are many ways to do it. You do it by presenting the viewpoint of an opposing um, idea. And I, there are many ways to do it. You do it by presenting an opposing idea in an interview within the piece. You do it by pointing out in the uh, on-camera close of the piece that it conflicts with uh, some previous fact or some likely outcome. But you do do it. And one thing that I've noticed in the difference between CBS versus ABC and NBC is that there's a diplomatic uh, White House and Pentagon correspondent in ABC and NBC. And here in CBS, <clears throat> the diplomatic and uh, Pentagon is reduced down to national security. Can you talk about, you know, why doesn't NBC, why didn't CBS have a diplomatic correspondent? CBS did have a, uh, an on-air person at the State Department until about 1990. Now, since then, we've had an off-air reporter who feeds material from the State Department to those of us who are on the air at the White House and the Pentagon. It isn't that the State Department is uncovered, it's that we have no one standing in front of a camera there. And by combining the two beats, uh, national secure under the general rubric of national security, you get uh, David Martin, who's an excellent reporter um, covering both places. He can certainly um, make phone calls to the State Department, and we have somebody there who covers the place all the time, feeding material to him. So I'm not sure that not having an on-camera presence matters that much. And, and so during this, when I you know looked through the, the time period, I saw during the uh, early weeks of March and late March, you were doing a lot of reporting on the second resolution. Do you, do you have a, what background or experience have you had previous with uh, international law or the, the United Nations? Was that because John Roberts was sent to Iraq that you were now covering the White House beat and then that was a political issue or can you kind of elaborate on that? I've covered the White House beat almost all of the time since 1981 and my specialty is American politics. But I did cover the diplomatic beat from 19, um, 90, I guess, 89 or 90, until 93, which was the period of the first Gulf War and of the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe. So I do have some experience with international affairs, uh, and I've followed it. So. I cover the White House. Uh, I still cover the White House. There are two of us there. And in Roberts' absence, I covered uh, continually both uh, early and late shifts. So so when you look back on November 8th of 2002 when the 1441 was passed, John Negroponte actually said uh, this resolution contains no hidden triggers and no automaticity. What did he mean by that? He meant that passing the resolution did not guarantee that there would be a war. And I guess the substance of what, what the French were saying is that you needed a, a second resolution in order for this war to be legal under international law. The United States continued to argue that it, no second resolution was needed because of the many previous resolutions calling on Iraq to divest itself of its uh, weapons of mass destruction which it never did to the satisfaction of the international community. So the U.S. argument was that no second resolution was needed. At the same time, they suggested that they would try to get one before going to war, then did not when it was obvious that 
it wouldn't work. This was uh, a matter of some discussion in the uh, news programs between, say, November and March. And what, from your sense, what was the international legal community, what were their thoughts on to this debate? You know, I'd have to say that um, although I read various opinions, I'm not sure that I could tell you today what they were. But um, the question I would have is um, whether the United States at any time felt constrained by international legal opinion. And I guess that goes to a lot of the international legal community. In fact, if you look at Michael Gettler's piece, he says and on March 18th, they finally published a piece that said most legal scholars disagree with the Bush administration's legal arguments. And if that's the case, if all this time period, international legal scholars are saying you have to get a second resolution, that seems to be a very important element that is not being contained in, in the stories. But if it's a given that the United States is going to go to war in any case, which I've suggested we all felt it was, and if it's a given that the United States was not much interested in the inspections process after it became obvious that they were moving slowly and not finding much, and if it's a given that the preparations for war are already well underway, then international legal opinion whatever it may be, however censorious it may turn out to be, would have little effect, would it? Looking in hindsight, though, you needed, a, you know, uh, authorization to have a coalition. And there, there seemed to be a lot of problems that, that resulted from that. A lot of uh, anti-war movement, this was their argument, the substance of which was not covered. Uh, if you look at what the inspections were, inspectors were saying, there's, there's little evidence for weapons of mass destruction. Where are they? It seemed to me to be a huge red flag. I'm not sure that anybody considered it a huge red flag because in the context of the U.S. government's approach to this, it was the U.N. Security Council which mattered, and only that. And by succeeding in getting one resolution in the fall of 2002, and promising that they would consider another one, even though they argued that legally they did not have to, they were, in their view, I think, covered. It might have been useful, I suppose, to suggest that international legal opinion uh, was against this, but I don't think that you can say that it would have been a changing factor um, in, in the argument. When the, the explanation that the Bush administration was giving for going after a second resolution that was merely a British political decision, what was the, the details of the, the political situation that, that Blair had promised his parliament? Well, Blair did make the promise, and the Bush administration was most anxious to keep um, Blair close to it, since Blair was a vocal supporter, obviously, of the U.S. position. And so it went out of its way or tried to to accommodate Blair's needs. Uh, he had more trouble with his parliament than Bush had with the U.S. Congress. Now, when you, when you look at it now, is it your sense that there were no weapons of mass destruction? or All I can tell you sitting here today is that there doesn't seem to be any evidence of a current stockpile of weapons of mass destruction, but I know no more than the weapons inspectors, most recently Charles Delfer, have told us. And that is that they can't find any. It's possible, I suppose, as some in the administration still suggest, that they could have been spirited out of the country. But in any case, they're not there. And, and so if we do look back on this time period and look at the argument of the Bush administration where they were saying they must disarm, otherwise we're going to war. Uh, and if we look and see there's no weapons of mass destruction, that seems to me to be basing a huge decision on an assumption that may or, not, may, or may not be true. 
Is it the role of the media to question that assumption? First of all, the assumption was that they did have weapons of mass destruction, and I don't think any reasonable person would suggest that they didn't believe that. Colin Powell put his reputation on the line at the United Nations. Uh, it now turns out that they, as we know now, received a lot of very bad intelligence, intelligence that wasn't really checked or well-sourced. But even with that, there were questions raised at the time about whether it was necessary to go to war and whether, in fact, the weapons of mass destruction that he had were easily, if he had them, were easily deliverable. And even Hans Blix was saying that he may or may not have them, though. Mm -hmm. And even Scott Ritter was saying, we destroyed 90 to 95 percent of their capability. Even the CIA declassified documents from the Gulf War Syndrome were saying that a lot of this capability had been destroyed. That's all true. But if you take it as a given, as I've already suggested to you that we did, that the administration was hell-bent on going to war, then you could only point out uh, the steps that were being taken down that path, despite the fact that there were no weapons of mass destruction found, and despite the fact that the international community disagreed. And from my perspective, when I look back on it, after the vote was made in November 8th for the second resolution, it seemed to be irrelevant whatever the weapons inspectors were reporting, even if they were poking holes in the, you know, it seems to me that the actual picking apart of the aluminum tubes of Hussein Kamel, who had said that they had destroyed all the weapons of mass destruction released by Newsweek, that the Niger documents, uh, looking back in hindsight, uh, should those have been you know, what, what would you have changed in looking back in this time period, if anything at all? Would it have been the same, or...? You're basically asking me to suggest that the news media could have done something in this case, and I don't really think that the way we operate, we could have. You know, the news media in the United States um, are not generally argumentative about the processes of government. They may be skeptical, and generally are, but not argumentative. It's a, it's a whole different discussion on how uh, we see our role. And I mean, this is part of what we discussed going into this. But to look back and suggest that because um, of the UN resolution in November, because of the weight of international legal opinion, um, things might have been different, is to suggest that the news media themselves, that is the daily reporting, would have brought this up. You're never going to see that in this country. If we're lucky, you will see specialists arguing this on the op-ed pages of the newspapers and on uh, television documentaries. But it isn't the kind of thing that you see in regular news coverage because argumentation is not part of our ethos. Does that seem to be a big gaping hole that needs to be corrected, though? What needs to be corrected, in my view, is the uh, lazy reliance on a stream of facts which are presented to the public every day. There needs to be some interpretation of those facts. There needs to be some checking of those facts, reality check, if you will. But to turn around and make the argument that an opposition politician would make is not the function of the daily press. Those voices must be heard. But it is not the function of the daily press to bring them to the fore. It, it seems to me that when the Democrats and the Republicans agree, you know, at what point can the press realize that international public opinion of other countries, that since we live in a globalized community now, uh, is there a way to have a global press of taking into concerns of, of other points of view other than just focusing just on the United States? Those points of view are widely available I'm in sorry, the United States. Point global points of view are widely available in the United States to those who care to seek them out. But in 
the regular media context, they are not as uh, they are not as often presented. You have to go look at them. You have to go find them. But again, would presentation of international opinion, which was a factor in the news coverage leading up to the war, have made any difference? It was not totally ignored, particularly in the context of how people felt uh, in Britain, France, and Germany, and all over Europe about the prospect of war. It was widely reported that the Europeans were against the war overwhelmingly. That made little or no difference to American public opinion. I think it was covered that there was a conflict, but the substance of the debate, uh, you know, could you present the actual French argument that they were making on the floor? What were they saying? Uh, you would not see that on, on American television. I'm sorry, you would not see what? Yeah. You weren't going to see on American television uh, what the French were saying uh, in, in Parliament, no. I'm not talking about Parliament. I'm talking about in the UN. What were the French saying in the UN? Oh, we did, we did talk about what the French were saying in the UN. We had uh, regular briefings from uh, Dominique de Villepin, uh, who uh, the foreign minister, uh, and from the French ambassador to the United Nations. Uh, they would come to that microphone at, uh, just outside the Security Council, and they were seen regularly when the United States, uh, when the United Nations was debating the resolution. But what was, I mean, if you could summarize their argument, what was their argument? The argument that was most often uh, heard was that um, there is no consensus, uh, that we need to let the inspectors continue their work, um, that uh, France or Germany is not uh, prepared yet to vote for another resolution. And in hindsight, were they right? Well, we know that there was no other resolution. But, I mean, when you say, in hindsight, were they right, what are you really asking? Could have the inspections verified that the disarmament had been completed? If inspections had verified that disarmament had been completed to the satisfaction of all members of the Security Council, uh, would the U.S. have still wanted to go to war? I think the answer is yes. And, and so then you step back and say, well, if they have a procedural violations where they fail to account for these chemical and biological weapons, and they just they destroyed them, but they didn't document it, is that enough reason to go to war? You would still, I suspect, have had the United States making the argument that based on the uh, UN resolutions, Security Council resolutions since 1990, since the first Gulf War, Iraq was in violation not only on weapons, but on any number of other um, fronts, including human rights, uh, they would have found Iraq wanting in any case. And they would have said that it was under the context of international law. Okay, and let me just, uh, yeah, take a drink. Um, now, one thing that you, you mentioned <coughs> in the interview with uh, Martha Joint Kumar is commercial broadcast in the bottom line. What is the bottom line? Commercial bottom line for commercial broadcasting is commercials. Commercial broadcasting, as it exists in the United States, is about audience. And it is commercial, so time is sold to advertisers. Advertisers... Uh, don't generally influence at the network level what's in the news, although sometimes at the lo local level they can be a pernicious influence. But at the same time, um, the need for an audience helps to drive the way we present the news. We can't take large chunks of time and just meander on about policy um, we no longer have documentaries uh, with any regularity. And most of what we do is done in um, a short attention span context. Does that need to change? Do, do we need to have more real, like, hard-hitting investigative journalism, or is that going to be too boring? That goes to a question about what the role of the commercial media is in 
uh, the post cable age. And I say post cable because now you have many other ways of delivering information, most notably uh, the net. And you have cable and you have local stations. Um, so what is the role of network news in this sort of new media age? We're still trying to sort it out. I mean, I can't say with any certainty what it will wind up being, but I can tell you this, with so many choices out there, uh, the onus is on the viewer to find those sources of information which he or she believes he or she needs. And I think even you yourself said the cable is doing a lot of repeating the official lines without a lot of analysis. So then is it the, the role of you know, the, the television news to provide more analysis or more, you know, a beat where they're actually looking at public record uh, versus actions and seeing the differences between that, you know, that could be a beat within itself. Looking, performing more analysis, looking more deeply at questions would be a fine idea on television. Somebody should do it. It might work on public television. You probably won't see it on commercial television. Is it a good idea? Absolutely. Is it likely to happen on commercial television? I don't think so. It, it, so is it the role of journalists to make things that are not necessarily interesting but yet very significant? Is it their role to try to find a way to make it interesting and, and dramatic? Good point. In the competition for viewers, in the competition for readers, Journalists must indeed try to make the material interesting without dumbing it down. But in any case, journalists do have an obligation to uh, get more deeply into material than you can in the context of a daily news operation, of the daily news flow. Where do you do it? Well, you do it in the, in the smaller magazines. You do it on cable television, on open access television. You even do it if you're making documentaries on the net. Now, the other argument which comes up immediately is, what's the responsibility of the people who use the public airwaves? Well, if I were king, there would be more news and documentary time, but I'm not. And the reality is that these are commercial entities which are struggling uh, for supremacy and sometimes survival in a cutthroat, doggy dog world. So is the public interest an externalized cost of the economics of the situation? Maybe. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the question of who serves the public interest is a good one, but it's not easy to answer. We in commercial broadcasting, try to serve the public interest in the context of what we're able to do. The public deserves more than we can always give them, but the argument is that there are many more people, many more, I'm sorry, the public deserves more than we can always provide them, but there are many more sources out there to give it to them. So yes, the public interest needs to be served, question which I can't answer is how much uh, each segment of the communications industry needs to serve the public interest. I think there's a lot of sources, but a lot of those sources, if you look at it, not a lot of them are giving a lot of deep analysis, a lot of context, a lot of, you know, looking at investigative reporting. And so you have right. more reports, that doesn't give you anything if you don't have that analysis still. Right, but who determines who determines what constitutes good public affairs reporting? Is it the government? I don't think so. Is it concerned journalists? Yes. What do they use to get it to the public? That's the difficult question. It's a, it should, it should be, in other words, be feeding broccoli to people who don't want to eat broccoli. Should you be doing it anyway, regardless if you're going to lose money? Look at the BBC in that context. The BBC has had to change the way it does business, far less so than we have in this country because it was never commercial to begin with. But nonetheless, 
The, the BBC, which was always the eat your peas uh, and listen carefully uh, network until it encountered competition from, uh, from commercial television, uh, has had to change the way it does business to compete for eyeballs. And you can feed broccoli to people who don't want to eat it, and they're not going to eat it. The broccoli should be out there for those who want to help themselves, but you can't force feed it. So when you look at, you know, let's look at March 12th, you know, and I don't know if you remember, but Elizabeth Smart was found, and that's the leading story. <clears throat> Why? Probably because most... Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. The Elizabeth Smart story on March 12th of that year was the leading story, probably because it was a human interest story, which was easier for people to comprehend uh, and certainly was good news, better than talking about the possibility of war, which was right around the corner. That, and, and in a way, is, uh, is it, why does that need to be a national story? Why do we need a a top headline, this is a good news, uh, why do we need to wipe out everything that's happening at the United Nations to talk about Elizabeth Smart? That's an argument. Uh, the argument over whether a story like the Elizabeth Smart story should lead a news broadcast when the nation is on the brink of war is a philosophical argument that you'd have to have with people who put together news broadcasts. Most reporters would prefer that it not be the lead, I suspect, but it was. So editorially, in other words, uh, there's a lot of things that happen that are beyond your control. Can you kind of sure. elaborate on that? Or? Ask any reporter what they think of their editors or producers, and you'll get an earful, because editors and producers do not always, in fact, frequently, do not agree with the reporter's judgment about how important his or her story is because they're building a broadcast or laying out a front page with something else in mind, with how many people they can attract to see it. Okay, and let me just see. But, uh, uh, do you see that uh, a lot of the reporting, reporting is uh, reacting to events in the government as opposed to uh, even if an event happens saying uh, that's not necessarily, you know, especially on issues of foreign policy when there's one big story. Reporting is much, a lot of reporting is reactive to begin with. Um, on foreign policy, uh, you have to ask yourself sometime, what happened to Haiti this week? What happened to the Sudan three months ago, before it became an issue. As we speak, it is something of a current issue. There are vast parts of the world which go ignored, even when there are serious problems of hunger or even genocide. So yeah, there's a huge focus problem. And it's very selective. It goes with, as one reporter pointed out recently, with the zeitgeist. And the zeitgeist is whatever's happening in the collective consciousness in one place, whether it's Washington or London or Moscow. And if the role of the journalist is to challenge power, should they challenge the framing of the government? The role of the journalist is to bring facts to the public. The role of the journalist is to be skeptical. The role of the journalist is to be uh, sort of anti-establishment to challenge, to question. Uh, that is almost always interpreted, of course, as being uh, against the government uh, or in U.S. political terms, usually interpreted as being liberal. And usually it is about uh, this ethic of suggesting that one should be skeptical of people in power. That doesn't mean that one is necessarily skeptical of the framework of government. Now, if one is, then perhaps you take it to another level and perhaps you're no longer a journalist. Perhaps you're either a revolutionary or a, uh, a political thinker. Journalists exist in this country under the freedom uh, assured by the First Amendment to ask questions, to challenge, 
and to say whatever is on their minds. Okay. Okay, a uh, couple more. Let's see if uh, that was really good. Uh, do, you, do you want some more water? Uh, sorry. Um, let's see. Oh, and if, if you look at where we're at now as a country in the world, you know, what is your vision for world peace? What we need, what does this country need to do to get to a state where uh, we're not fighting a war on terrorism or the war on terrorism is done, it's won, or how do we get to the point where we're all cooperating? The vision of world peace is something that politicians talk about but seldom take the apparent steps, the readily apparent steps to achieve. Whether it's possible is a big question mark. Whether this or any government is doing enough is also a big question mark, but people's perceptions of what needs to be done to ensure world peace are one can be 180 degrees apart. I give you, for example, the view of some people in the Pentagon at the moment that only the projection of massive U.S. power will guarantee world peace versus the view on the left, which hold that, holds that uh, power is a destabilizing thing and that we should reach out to other nations as equals. It's very hard to know um, where the balance should be there, but whatever my view is, isn't going to change it. This government and any government is going to pursue it according to its own lights. But should that be an uh, investigative report? Uh, we're addressing this issue of world peace for an entire week on CBS. It would be interesting to know what one could put in such a report. I'd have to think about it. It's, it's not necessarily a bad idea. You'd have to find the people to make the argument, to frame it, um, and you'd have to get somebody probably in government to say they were willing to deal with it. It's not necessarily a bad idea to look at, but it's very abstract, and we don't deal in abstractions particularly well. It, so talk about issues that are very complex. You know, do they just not get covered, or there's got to be a way to, to do it. I mean, that's what I'm trying to do in a way. Covering complex issues means that you either have to, for television, break them down into their simplest elements and then try to illustrate those, preferably with something graphic, or give yourself a great deal of time, something we don't have in commercial television, and lay it out and hope that you can hold the audience's interest. This is a big if. You have to be compelling enough, if you're talking about a complex issue, to hold audience's opinion. Remember back to being in college when the best lecturers were able to hold your attention for 50 minutes by being spellbinding in their accounts of what happened in the past um, or making their theories understandable to you. That's what you have to do. And that's what you do in the documentary field. That's what you do in long-form documentaries, whether they're on television or on film. That's what you do in a long magazine article. It's not what you do in a minute and a half television piece. So can you, can you take a whole half hour, a whole 22 minutes of content and just dedicate it to one topic? Or would you, you lose your audience? You can take a whole half hour or uh, whatever of, of, you can take a whole half hour, you can dedicate it to one topic, and if you're good, you won't lose your audience. If you're not, they won't watch. Have you seen Michael Moore's Fahrenheit 9-11? I have. And, you know, it, it seems like he could, you know, with his kind of looser view on objectivity, uh, he seemed to be able to do it. Is, is that something that there seems to be the success of that film, that people are really hungry for these complex ideas to be tackled? I don't know that I'd take that out of it. I mean, Michael Moore's view of objectivity is more or less non-existent. He's uh, arguing a point of view. Uh, he's a skillful filmmaker, but he's uh, a little loose with the facts and um, with a lot of cheap shots. That's fine. I mean, that's what he chose to do, and it is entertaining. But, um, you know, it's an argument, and that's fine. So he captures, so he captures the audience's attention, and they either like it or don't like it. 
Um, but I wouldn't characterize it as a rigorous look, you know, at any, it's not a rigorous argument. But if you look at the success of the film, there seems to be a lot of people who are hungry for that. Would you agree? I, you know, sure. I mean, people will, people want to be entertained. That's, he can entertain you. But in the process of that, does it change your mind? Depends on what you bring to the film. Not so much on the skill of the filmmaker, but on the mindset you bring to the film. If you're a uh, committed anti-Bush person, you're going to love it. And if you're uh, skeptical, you may find the And if you love Bush, you're going to hate it. Okay, let's just sit here for a couple seconds for room tone.